Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're looking at a video from World Video Bible School, but we're going to give Kyle Butt a break for now and move on to Dr. Jeff Miller. Don't let that PhD fool you though, once again we're looking at someone who is allowed to call himself doctor, but isn't actually qualified in anything relevant to evolution. At least, I don't think his PhD in mechanical engineering is relevant. And while they're not exactly hiding the fact that his degree is irrelevant, it is right out the top of their main website after all, they also put it in the video without specifying that it's got nothing to do with biology, so if you only see the video on YouTube and never visit their website, you just know that he's a PhD who is talking about evolution, so you might wrongly assume that his PhD is relevant to evolution. Now this is part one of the WVBS series entitled Science vs. Evolution, which I plan on covering in its entirety. Before we begin though, I just want to give a special shout out to the YouTube channel Pure Carbon, who designed the 3D printable avatar that I've been using since redoing my Patreon levels. He makes response videos similar to mine, but he goes into subjects that I tend to avoid, like Jordan Peterson. And he has better hair. So go give his channel a look. Now on to Dr. Jeff. Come now and let us reason together. Well, Pornhub is offering free premium memberships at the moment, so the first part of that is easy enough. But reasoning can be a bit difficult while in the refractory period. That's what we're interested in doing. That's what we want to do in this seminar. We want to think, to use our heads, not just accept a belief, whether creation or evolution, without evidence. Okay, good. I can agree that that is a good way to conduct an investigation. Then I can assume that you are, at some point in the series, actually going to present evidence specifically for creation rather than relying entirely on attempting to poke holes in the evidence for evolution, right? I mean, I understand that in order for your particular view of creation to be true, evolution must be dismantled, but even if you do successfully dismantle evolution, that does not prove creationism to be accurate. That just means that evolution is wrong. If the main suspect of a murder investigation is exonerated, that does not automatically make the secondary suspect guilty. We want to examine the evidence and reason through to the appropriate conclusion, hopefully without bias. Seems like being unbiased would be a simple concept. Yeah, it's simple in theory, but our brains work in weird ways to reinforce our previously held beliefs. This is why peer review is so important. Scientists submit their work to other scientists who have expertise in the field but no motivation to agree with the findings of their research, and so the reviewers will be able to find flaws in methodology that might not have been apparent to the original researchers. And this is why creationist research journals are so very useless. They usually have clauses in their publication guidelines specifically stating that papers will not be published if they go against certain predetermined conclusions. They willfully admit that they refuse to publish anything that is against their bias. Like this one from AIG, where the editor-in-chief reserves the right to refuse to publish anything he disagrees with. Or this statement of belief that all members of the Creation Research Society must subscribe to before they can be published in their quarterly research journal. Go read the submission guidelines for any reputable scientific journal, and if you can find me anything like this where they state that you have to have certain conclusions before they'll even consider publishing you, I'll send you $50. So before we even begin to look at the creation versus evolution debate, just look to see which side is insisting on their bias being accepted before they'll even consider publishing research. But we know sometimes that's pretty difficult to do because we tend to want to believe what we want to, whatever's convenient, without having to feel bad about it, without guilt. So it's easy to become biased against anything that goes against what we want to believe and practice. Guilt doesn't necessarily come into the equation with biases. Guilt can result in certain cognitive biases, like motivated reasoning, but things like confirmation bias are not caused by guilt. They're caused by our previously held beliefs. If you believe that people act crazy when the moon is full, you don't feel guilty when you notice that people are acting crazy and the moon happens to be full. You also don't forget the times when people were acting crazy and the moon was not full because you felt guilty. You're just trying to set up the they only believe evolution because they want to sin line by planting the seeds of your idea before you fully elaborate on it. In other words, you are actively trying to create a bias so that when they hear you say the next thing, it makes sense despite not actually making sense. 
Many are biased against evolution because of a strong desire to retain their belief in God in spite of whatever evidence they may have been presented with, and vice versa. Many are biased against creation, religion. Religion certainly can stand in the way of what we want to believe and practice at times. The idea of God carries with it many expectations, expectations that we just don't want to hear sometimes. Okay, but what about all the Christians and people of other religions who accept evolution? Would it be fair to say that they are the least biased because they've found a way to hold on to both viewpoints? Maybe there's a way to accept evolution without it threatening your faith. And maybe there's a way to have faith without having to reject science. There's a reason I often go to places like BioLogos for information on evolution. I am biased against religion, and I know that. But my argument is not with religion, it's with people who deny science. So when I am presenting science, I will use religious sources when I can to make it clear that I am not accepting the science out of a desire to reject God. The science is completely independent of a belief in God. There are many positive proofs for the existence of God and the inspiration of the Bible. A listing of those proofs is not the goal of this seminar. You can see materials addressing those topics on our website, www.apologeticspress.org. In this seminar, we want to look at the opposite side of the coin, the main response to the creation model that is given by atheists today. <sighs> Great. So no support for your side in this entire series. Just you trying to poke holes in the evolution side. Wonderful. Atheists, these are people who don't believe in God. Evolutionary theory is their response to the question of creation and origins. <sighs> Do I need to say it again? Have I not said it enough? It comes up in almost every creationist video. Should I repeat myself in every one of my videos on the matter? Okay, so here we go for the gazillionth time. There are more religious people of all the various faiths who accept evolution than there are atheists total. Even narrowing it down to just Christians, there are approximately 500 million atheists in the world. There are about 1.2 billion Roman Catholics in the world. The Roman Catholic Church's official position is that evolution is true. I do know that there are Catholics who deny evolution, though, so let's just pretend that half of the world's Catholics go against what their official church position is and deny evolution. That still leaves us with 600 million Catholics that accept evolution. So there are likely more Catholics who accept evolution than there are atheists total. And that's not even getting into the other Christian denominations or other religions. So please, creationists, stop claiming that evolution is the atheist response to the idea of God having created things, because that is just flat out wrong. I want to qualify my argument about creation being scientific. I want to make sure I define my terms clearly. I am all for making sure our terms are defined clearly. Does that mean we can expect a clear definition for what a kind is at some point in this series? Or information? That'd be nice, but I won't be holding my breath. Just because someone calls himself a creationist, it doesn't mean that he's using logic and reason and the evidence from science to arrive at that conclusion. No, I would go a bit further than that. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that someone who calls himself a creationist is actually most definitely not following the evidence to their conclusion. The biblical portrait of faith is not what many in Christendom define it to be, believing something without evidence and, and even against reason and common sense. So the Bible does not clearly define faith as being the assurance of things hoped for and the convictions of things not seen in Hebrews 11? This definition makes it rather obvious that faith does not have evidence. I mean, the Bible also says to be ready to give a defense of your faith, so yeah, it is possible to interpret that in other ways to make these two passages line up. But should that really be necessary? Was God unable to make his message clear? And besides which, if you're asserting that you have evidence for God and young earth creationism, if that's the case, faith need never enter the equation. Just present the evidence. You don't need faith if you actually have evidence, no matter how you define faith. Flip the script and define it as trust if you want, with that old bit about how we have faith that the couch won't collapse when you sit on it. Okay, that's trust based on previous experience. Previous experience certainly counts as a form of evidence, but in order to count as actual evidence, it does need to be repeatable. Is anything in creationism repeatable? Biblical faith is like the trust we have in a parent or a friend. Do we blindly trust our parents? No, we trust them because they've proven themselves to be trustworthy. In other words, our faith is based on evidence. Trust based on previous experience, yeah. 
Also, if we're following the Bible here, you kind of have to trust your parents because the Bible tells you to honor your parents, and if you want to strictly follow biblical law, it orders the death penalty for disobedience. So you really do have to trust and obey your parents in the biblical framework, because if you don't, you end up dead. But I feel like this whole half hour video is going to be you pounding this point home. If you actually had evidence on your side, you wouldn't need a half hour introduction to say that you have evidence, and at the same time point out that you're not going to present the evidence. You would just, you know, present the evidence. In this seminar I argue that faith in naturalistic evolution, a doctrine in which atheists must believe, Nope, that's uh, not true at all. I have personally known atheists who do not believe in evolution. Evolution is not a universally held belief. And since there have been atheists for far longer than there has been a theory of evolution, I'm going to go ahead and say that belief in evolution is not a prerequisite for being an atheist. Though certainly atheists have no reason to reject the scientific consensus on the matter because there's really no bias there. Nothing about atheism insists that you accept evolution. But there's also nothing about atheism that insists that certain scientific ideas are off limits either, so you don't end up with very many atheists denying science based on their worldview. That's actually a blind faith. So. Accepting the consensus of scientists who have spent their entire lives dedicated to studying evolution and its processes is blind faith rather than trust based on previous experience, but thinking that 99% of scientists across multiple fields including biology, geology, and astronomy are wrong, despite all appearances the earth is only 6,000 years old, and all the things that make it look older are the result of misinterpretation of evidence is scientific? Like. Seriously, just look at the fact that we have evidence of societies going on normally when there was supposed to have been a global flood. Combine that with an unbroken dendrochronological record that goes back thousands of years before you think the universe was created, and the fact that we have living organisms that are tens of thousands of years old, but no, it's the people who listen to scientists who are being unscientific. People who believe in things for which there is no evidence are being, by definition, irrational. And this applies to both creationists and evolutionists. In the field of philosophy, what's known as the law of rationality is used to determine whether a person is being irrational or illogical. Why is this a thing that creationists do? They always make up laws that nobody outside of creationism actually calls laws. There is the law of rational indices in chemistry with regards to crystal formation, but in philosophy there is no singular law of rationality. In fact, as with most things in philosophy, exactly what constitutes rationality is in dispute, with some holding to internalism where being rational involves instrumental reason relative to your desires, so acting rationally is a matter of acting in a way that is conducive to the fulfillment of your desires, so say if you want to go skydiving then booking skydiving lessons would be rational, even if external factors make that seem irrational. So if you're booking skydiving lessons with the money that you were supposed to use to pay rent, a philosopher who holds to internalism would still call that rational but a philosopher who holds to externalism would call these skydiving lessons irrational because externally it is rational to fulfill your basic needs before considering your other desires, so it's the external factors that determine rationality. It goes deeper and gets more complicated than that, but I have a feeling that this basic understanding is already more than is necessary here. The next thing he does is just quote a bunch of Bible verses that could be loosely interpreted as stating that there is evidence for the God of the Bible, things like Romans where it says the invisible attributes have been clearly seen, and Psalm 19 where it says that the heavens declare the glory of God, so I'm just going to skip all that. So according to the creation model, there's evidence for creation. According to the Bible, there is evidence that the Bible is true, yes. But the question here is whether or not this evidence points exclusively to the God of the Bible. And since Christians can't even agree universally on who the God of the Bible even is, that leaves me with the impression that any of the versions of God worshipped by any Christian denomination are not being pointed to exclusively by the Bible, much less any evidence that is external to the Bible. We can examine nature and conclude that it points to God. Even if it did point to a god, it doesn't get us specifically to any particular god. So maybe a god that can get along with the scientific consensus as to how old the universe is and how life diversified is one that is more highly evidenced than the young earth creationist god. Now the naturalist, the atheist, argues that he bases his beliefs on things you can observe physically and argues that creationists can't observe god, so that makes me unscientific in his mind. 
Poorly phrased as usual, but basically yes. The National Academy of Sciences is an organization that heavily influences what's taught in schools and textbooks across America, and it's heavily influenced by naturalists today. Here's how they define science. One goal of science is to understand nature. The statements of science must invoke only natural things and processes. The statements of science are those that emerge from the application of human intelligence to data obtained from observation and experiment. Progress in science consists of the development of better explanations for the causes of natural phenomena. Well, that's actually a few excerpts of the conclusion of chapter three of the book, Teaching About Evolution and the Nature of Science. If you want a definition of science itself, the intro to the chapter is probably a bit more concise. Science is a particular way of knowing about the world. In science, explanations are restricted to those that can be inferred from confirmable data, the results obtained through observations and experiments that can be substantiated by other scientists. In other words, if it can be observed, measured, and repeated, it can be part of science. If you have to mess with this definition in order to sneak creationism in as scientific, then creationism is not scientific. The only thing missing here is something that is touched on in part of the conclusion that you skipped, predictive power. The utility of science is that it makes predictions about how the world works, which is the basis of all modern technology. If we couldn't predict the behavior of transistors in a processor, then computers wouldn't exist. If we couldn't predict the amount of lift generated by an airplane's wing, then we wouldn't have flight. If we couldn't predict the rate at which yeast turns sugar into alcohol, we wouldn't have $300 bottles of wine. Notice how much they emphasize natural, nature, observation. Anything supernatural has been kicked out of the classroom. How would you go about conducting an experiment on something supernatural? What are its properties? Is it repeatable? Can independent scientists arrive at the same results when replicating your experiment? It's not just that they've excluded supernatural phenomena from science, it's that supernatural phenomena do not have explanatory or predictive power, and so are scientifically useless. There's also the fact that over time, natural explanations for observed phenomena have always, 100% of the time, replaced supernatural explanations. Never have we replaced a natural one with a supernatural one. God, creation? That's not natural. You can't observe that, so it's unscientific. Basically, yes. Many of the greatest scientific minds of the past, the fathers of many scientific disciplines, were creationists who looked at science as a study that pointed to God, and yet the NAS won't even allow God in the classroom? Yes, many, I'd even go so far as to say most, of what we would call scientists have in the past been religious, and have seen their work as a study of God's handiwork, whichever God they happen to believe in. Many scientists today are still religious. This indicates that God and science are not necessarily mutually exclusive. But just because they are not mutually exclusive does not mean that religion should be taught in a science classroom. Those are two completely different subjects. When studying how nature works, it is reasonable to expect the natural mechanisms are what are focused on. And if an unbiased study of nature and its mechanisms really and truly did point to your God, then you shouldn't be afraid of it. Well, is creation unscientific, really? I mean, you were literally just complaining that we won't allow magic as an explanation in scientific research, so I'm going to go with yes. Well, granted, we can't directly observe God. We, we can't taste, touch, hear, smell, or see Him, so we can't use empirical science to directly prove that God exists. So then, by definition, the proposition God as an explanation for anything is unscientific. But it doesn't follow that there's no physical evidence for His existence. Sure, there might be scientific evidence that would point to a god, but it would have to point to God specifically, and that still doesn't get you to a point where saying God did it becomes a scientific explanation for anything. It just gets you to a point where, at best, the scientific explanation is an explanation of exactly how God did it. Ironically, much of evolutionary science is based on indirect, not direct evidence. Much of it, yes, but not all of it. Evolution itself has been directly observed, and even much of what you are calling indirect is still based on direct evidence. So, for instance, how do we know that a rock that we found a fossil in is a certain age? Well, we can measure the radioactive decay of some of the elements in the rock. 
This is a direct measurement of the decay rate. We have been measuring these decay rates for about the last century, and they have never been found to change outside of certain margins for error that are accounted for by imprecise measurements. We can then use this information to determine how long it would have taken for the radioactive elements in the rock to decay to their current levels, using methods that will directly determine whether your calculations of the initial levels of those elements are accurate, and will directly determine if there has been any contamination or loss of those elements. All of this is direct science, which has given us dates for rocks in the billions of years range. The best that creationists can do in this scenario is say that maybe the global flood changed the decay rates and made them all look older than they are. Never with any proposed mechanism for such a change that might be tested, just an assertion that it happened. In fact, the flood is usually the creationist escape hatch from any science that makes the Earth look old. Biogeography and paleontology, when taken together, demonstrate that the continents were together in the past. Must have been a global flood. What caused the tectonic plates to move so fast during the flood and so slow now? Uh, the fountains of the deep opened up. Okay, how did that happen? What caused it? God, obviously. Okay, but what mechanism did he use? That's the problem, right there. There is never any proposed testable mechanism, just assertions. And that is why it is not scientific. Since no one has ever witnessed many of the fundamental premises of evolution, like abiogenesis. Abiogenesis is not a fundamental premise of evolution. It is the logical conclusion of evolution extrapolated backward, but it is not a premise. The only premise is that life began and was less diverse when it began, and this is supported by direct evidence. Matter spontaneously generating. Do you mean the Big Bang? Because once again, that's not evolution. Evolution is the process by which biological organisms diversified. Sure, they wouldn't diversify if there wasn't a universe in which to do it, but that doesn't make the origin of the universe part of the theory of evolution. Create uh, creatures evolving across phylogenic boundaries? I assume you mean phylogenetic here, since phylogenic isn't a word. I've also heard plenty about such boundaries, but I've never heard exactly where they are supposed to be. Sometimes a bold creationist will say species, but then other creationists will fully admit that speciation is a thing that happens, and so they place it higher up. But never is a mechanism described that would stop the crossing of such boundaries. But in reality, evolution does not predict that phylogenetic boundaries would be crossed, assuming that you mean that some species will eventually evolve outside of its parent clades. No, we are still part of the categories that defined our ancestors. That's why we are all eukaryotes, and vertebrates, and mammals, and primates, etc. A Big Bang creating a universe? These phenomena and others haven't been observed, and yet they're considered science. Okay, if you're just going to come out and say Big Bang later, then what exactly did you mean by that whole matter spontaneously generating thing? But here's the thing about the Big Bang. Firstly, it was initially described by a devout Roman Catholic, so no trying to escape God there. Secondly, various religions latched onto the idea of the Big Bang because it provided them with a moment of creation. The leading hypothesis up to that point was that the universe was in a steady state. It had always been as it is now. That did not sit well with people who believed in creation, so the Big Bang was a validation for religious believers. Secondly, the model that predicted the Big Bang also made other predictions, which have since been validated. For instance, the existence of the cosmic microwave background radiation. The CMB was predicted by the math of the Big Bang long before we had the technology to directly observe it. But when we developed that technology, guess what we found? The CMB, right where it was supposed to be. That's a really neat trick if the Big Bang theory is wrong. So if you suggest that the Big Bang is indeed wrong, then you need to have a model that satisfies all of the same predictions it has made, and then some. They're allowed to be kept in the classroom, the textbooks, and creation isn't, when both are based on indirect evidence. The main difference here is that the Big Bang has made testable predictions that have since been verified. Can creationism say the same? No, it cannot. Okay, so I'm less than halfway through his half hour video, and my video is getting to be about a half hour as well, so I'm going to cut it off here. Most of the rest of his video is actually kind of irrelevant here, he just goes into an explanation as to why the young earth creationist view of Christianity is the correct one, and he uses arguments that even AIG would disagree with. 
For instance, he says that in Genesis, the word yom is used rather than another word that can mean an unspecified period of time. Except Ken Ham himself will tell you that an unspecified period of time is one of the four potential meanings for the word yom. He also says that the Hebrews would not have developed a seven-day week if it were a metaphor. They would have had a week where they worked six long unspecified periods of time before resting on a seventh long unspecified period of time. Because I guess interpreting metaphors is a foreign concept to him? It's all theological debate, though, trying to convince other Christians Christians that his Christianity is the right one. So while it is amusing to watch him flail around desperately for an argument, it is irrelevant. But he does eventually swing back and basically repeat what I've already covered here, uh, but he does clarify what he means when he says evolution. So I will make that the last part of his video that I will cover. So in this seminar, when I use the term evolution, I'm using it in the way many naturalists use it. The theory of how the universe got here, not just species, materialists, naturalists, atheists use the term evolution as a catch-all word, and they simply lump the entire history of the universe into the word evolution. Nope. You're getting atheists, materialists, and naturalists confused with creationists here. On this channel, I have to constantly point out, as I have in this very video, that evolution as a scientific theory only applies to biological diversity. The word evolution can be used colloquially to just mean change over time for pretty much anything, so sometimes people will speak of things like the evolution of cell phones and whatnot. But when speaking scientifically, evolution has a very specific meaning, and it has nothing to do with the origin of the universe. That's it for today. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Marilyn Newman, who says, Okay, this exceeded my gag reflex. 16 minutes and 15 seconds in. An hour and 1 minute and 43 seconds is the total runtime. So yeah, this was on my live stream where Mrs. Rhino and I watched episode 1 of Salty, and it was... something. I do not recommend. Thanks for watching. Special thanks, as always, to my patrons, who are the 3D printers that are making face shields for my healthcare workers. Not finishing that with a joke today, just that if you have a 3D printer, call your local hospitals to see if they could use something like these 3D printed face shields and start printing. See you next time!